The House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation uh, of the rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address or contact full committee staff. Please keep your video function on at all times, even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with House Res 965 and the accompanying regulation, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they're not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum. I'll now recognize myself for opening remarks pursuant to notice. We're holding a hearing today entitled Understanding Authoritarianism and Kleptocracy uh, in Russia. For more than two decades, Vladimir Putin has ruled Russia with an iron fist. He seized control of the Russian economy, co-opted and controlled Russia's political and security institutions, and made brazen attempts to spread Russia's malign influence far beyond the near abroad to Western Europe, to Africa, and to right here in the United States. Putin supported by a close group of oligarchs, personal connections and mutually dependent relationships has threatened democratic movements around the world and stifled dissent within Russia's borders. Opposition leader and politician Alexei Navalny represents the most recent and most visible member uh, of uh, example of Putin's crushing reaction to any inkling of dissent. Today, Mr. Navalny remains in prison on bogus charges after having suffered from an assassination attempt, the evidence of which was largely released from the work of one of our witnesses here today, Mr. Christo Grozel. Despite the treatment he's endured, Mr. Navalny continues to show bravery in the face of such malicious and malign uh, regime activities. But Mr. Navalny is not alone uh, as a target and victim of the Kremlin's assassination squads. Sergei and Yulia Skrepov were the target of an attempted poisoning in 2018. Vladimir Kazimurza was the target of an attempted poisoning in 2015 and 2017. And Boris Nepsov was tragically assassinated within walking distance of the Kremlin in 2015. Unfortunately, hundreds of more political prisoners, including Paul Whelan, exist in Russia today. This is a higher number than at the height of the Soviet Union. Yet what we miss in these discussions about political repression are the daily realities that everyday Russians have to face. Russia is fraught with economic hardship, decreased standards of living, and limited opportunities for young people. Environmental disasters are now affecting the health and safety of Russians around the country. This includes just last year, when during the height of the pandemic, 21,000 tons of oil spilled directly into the Arctic from the Russian refinery. In addition, Russians continue to face treacherous housing conditions, with most people continuing to live in crumbling Soviet-era concrete blocks. And Soviet-era landfills face catastrophic overflows, directly affecting the health and safety of nearby residents. But it's just not the environment and environmental and economic problems that Putin wants us, and most importantly, the Russian people, to forget. It's the widespread and outrageous corruption that he and his government fosters at home. Russian oligarchs and Putin himself have stolen billions, if not trillions, off the backs of hardworking Russians. That stolen money has since been laundered through Western financial systems, tax havens abroad, and hard to trace assets like art and real estate. In short, under the corrupt leadership of Vladimir Putin, Russian authoritarianism and kleptocracy know no bounds. In order to fill the gap in public knowledge and perception created by the brutal crackdown on independent media in Russia, Radio Free Europe and a few of the remaining independent outlets, like Medusa, have been on a mission to cover the stories of everyday Russians. Their work has gained widespread recognition and following uh, throughout the world and in Russia. And in response, the Russian government has enacted undemocratic legal frameworks in a clear attempt to force them out of business. Radio Free, uh, Radio Free Europe, under the skillful leadership of Jamie Fly, has been forced to 
relocate their offices and employees. And Medusa has had to call upon their own readership uh, for resources to pay exorbitant fines. We've seen similar crackdowns on free speech in Belarus. And just this past weekend, the world witnessed the first ever illegal forced landing of a civilian plane resulting in an unlawful imprisonment uh, of next to founder Roman uh, Patasevich. He was uh, taken uh, hostage as well as his girlfriend, uh, Sonia Sepega. These acts just simply can't be tolerated. They are unprecedented, unprecedented and the free speech must be maintained throughout the post-Soviet space. So how has Putin maintained control with such bleak circumstances facing Russians at home and chaos surrounding their international exploits abroad? To answer this question, Ranking Member Fitzpatrick and I have invited four outstanding witnesses to help us better understand the ways in which Vladimir Putin has wielded his power in the political, economic, and security spheres. Through this hearing, we'll be able to assess the seemingly ever-increasing status of Russian authoritarianism and its mission to threaten democracy both at home and abroad. And we'll explore the proportional and appropriate steps that the Biden administration and we, as members of the United States Congress, can take to confront and prevent Russian malign influence. In the face of increasing Russian aggression and with Russia's upcoming parliamentary election set to take place in the fall, in an environment which many predict will lack democratic oversight, this conversation is more important right now than ever. And I look forward to our discussion and now welcome the ranking member to give his opening remarks. Good afternoon and thank you, Chairman Keating. And I would also like to thank this panel for joining us. Today we gather to acknowledge the system of corruption established by the Putin regime to consolidate power and resources uh, amongst his closest circles at the expense, by the way, the, uh, of the people of Russia. Uh, we will also discuss how Putin and his regime use their ill-gotten gains to advance the Kremlin's malign agenda. Congress has the ability and the obligation to inspire uh, whole of government strategies to counter kleptocracy and authoritarianism abroad. Uh, the damage caused by kleptocracy is not simply contained within Russia's borders, but takes advantage of all nations engaged in free enterprise. And since around 2000, uh, Putin has cemented his authoritarian rule by enriching his closest colleagues and confidants and placing them in positions of power. In doing so, Putin has fused uh, government business, organized crime, and covert operations together into one uh, kleptocratic system uh, that threatens Western interests. Uh, this cohort has gone on to wield uh, their enormous ill-gotten wealth abroad to purchase real assets and influence for their own benefit. A report by the Atlantic Council on Russian dark money estimates that up to $1 trillion in dark money is invested globally, uh, which stands in stark contrast to the stagnant economy of Russia itself. Last summer, at the height of the pandemic, uh, Vladimir Putin held an illegal referendum on constitutional changes that would allow him to remain in power until the year 2036. This phenomenon, therefore, cannot be ignored. Uh, instead, it must be addressed with decisive diplomatic action, cooperation amongst our allies, and by building our collective resilience against this threat. Earlier this year, Chairman Keating and I introduced a bill to slow the creep of kleptocracy. HR 402, known as the Countering Russian and Other Overseas Kleptocracy Act, passed through our committee markup with bipartisan support. Anti-corruption measures must be at the forefront of our foreign policy strategy, as dirty money impoverishes everyday citizens from its origin and it stains its destination. Russian uh, kleptocrats uh, abuse democratic society's freedoms to infiltrate their own financial systems their own institutions and their own markets. The Russians have developed a powerful uh, set of tools to undermine democracies around the world uh, and have shown their willingness to use it. And sadly, there are too many enablers uh, who allow dirty money to enter Western financial systems and influence our domestic policies. A very clear example of this is Nord Stream 2, which not only exports a dependency on Russian natural gas to Europe, but it's also the largest symbol of Kremlin strategic corruption and elite capture in all of Europe. 
This project has been condemned by Congress literally since the pipeline's inception through targeted mandatory sanctions that I and many others in this room have supported to stop this project once and for all. It must be the policy of the United States to continue opposing this geopolitical weapon. And I urge this administration to immediately remove the waivers that spared Nord Stream 2 AG, the company, uh, its CEO, and its corporate officers from sanctions. And it's my hope that uh, Mr. Edward Lucas can further explain how Nord Stream 2 will be used by the Kremlin as a mechanism to export corruption throughout Europe. Finally, it's critical to note how this crony government enriches itself while oppressing the everyday citizens of Russia. The U.S. Department of State's Human Rights Report for 2020 on Russia details a litany of human rights issues. Under Putin's authoritarian playbook, extrajudicial killings, torture, arbitrary and unjust arrests are, and imprisonments are commonplace. Russia also actively suppresses independent media, peaceful assembly, associations, religious freedom, uh, and the ability to participate in the political process. This ongoing attack by the Putin regime on Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's operation in Russia, is an example of how the autocrat uh, in the Kremlin would use any means necessary to silence voices he cannot control. Addressing global kleptocracy must not be a partisan issue. And I believe every member of this committee would agree that the Putin regime is a destabilizing, malign actor that poses a serious threat to our shared democratic values. And it's therefore my hope that with the information gleaned today, we can continue working together to raise our resilience and combat Putin's kleptocratic system. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the ranking member. And uh, as I introduce our witnesses, I think we'll all realize what an extraordinary uh, panel we have in front of us here today. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be part of this important hearing, uh, one that clearly ha has great significance in terms of uh, current ongoing events. Uh, professor, uh, professor Marsha uh, Gessen is a staff writer at The New Yorker magazine, an author on issues related to authoritarianism, democracy, and human rights, and a distinguished writer in residence at Bard College. Professor Gessen's best-selling books on Vladimir Putin and totalitarianism in Russia have moved the needle in examining Russia's malign activities. Dr. Yuval Weber is a research assistant professor at Texas A&M's Bush School of Government and Public Service and currently serving as the uh, brand chair of Russian military and political strategy at the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Creativity at the Marine Corps University. Mr. Christo Grozev is a is the lead Russian investigator with Bellingcat, an independent research organization which specializes in open source intelligence investigations. Mr. Grozev received the 2019 European Press Prize for Investigative Reporting Award for his reporting on the poisoning of Sergei Skripal in the UK. And Bellingcat, as an organization, has received numerous awards for its reporting. Mr. Edward Lucas is a non-resident senior fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, also known as CEPA. He was formerly a senior editor at The Economist. I'll now recognize the witnesses for five minutes each, and without objection, your prepared written statement will be made a part of the record. Professor Gessen, you're now recognized for your opening statement. Professor Gessen. Apologies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Masha Gessen. I have spent most of my life trying to describe political and social transformations in Russia. In 2011, 2012, I was also an activist in the protests against Putin's regime. I had to leave in 2013 when, like many opposition journalists and organizers, I was threatened by the government. In my case, the threat was that my adopted son would be removed from the family because he was being raised by a same-sex couple. Vladimir Putin has been in power for almost 22 years and appears to, pl to plan to stay in power forever. His power and his longevity rest on three pillars, fear, domination over the information sphere, and perceived legitimacy. So I will go through those in turn. One, fear. It is impossible to compile a full list of deaths and assassination attempts in which the Kremlin is implicated. 
The attempt to kill opposition politician Alexei Navalny with the nerve agent Novichok is the best known and best documented example. The violent or sudden death of a high profile activist sends a message to anyone who is considering speaking out. You're risking your life. The reminders keep coming. For members of Navalny's organization, including junior behind the scenes staff in their 20s, police visits in the middle of the night, violent searches and arbitrary detentions have become routine. And you never know when one of those detentions will turn into a criminal case that will send you to prison to a prison colony for several years. According to the human rights organization Memorial, Russia currently has 80 political prisoners and more than 400 people who are facing politically motivated charges but are not in prison. This is more political prisoners than Russia held at the height of the Cold War, and the tally is likely far from complete. To create an atmosphere of terror, the Kremlin goes not only after prominent national and local activists, but after ordinary protesters. In the winter and spring of 2021, Moscow police made a point of detaining at least three different well-known and much-loved retired school teachers, women in their 60s and 70s. In each case, police officers came to the woman's home, told her that she had been identified by facial recognition software, and took her to the precinct for as long as 24 hours. Altogether, this year, police have made more than 10,000 arrests as a result of protests against Navalny's arrest. About 100 people are facing likely prison sentences. Some of these people stand accused of violating pandemic regulations. Anti-pandemic measures have become merely the tools of a punitive bureaucracy. Russia is the first country to have started distributing a vaccine, yet vaccination rates are negligibly low and death rates are strikingly high. The regime kills its enemies and lets ordinary people die. Not only acting politically, but simply living in Russia is scary. Domination over the information sphere. Putin's kind of autocracy doesn't need to control every media outlet. What it has to do is dominate. This year, law enforcement has specifically targeted for arrests, detentions, and apartment raids, journalists who have covered protests for opposition media. Last month, the leading Russian language independent media outlet, Meduza, was declared a foreign agent, a scarlet letter. Meduza lost its entire advertising base overnight. In the last few weeks, they have had to forfeit their office space, cut salaries, and ask their readers for help. Any media outlet can be effectively silenced with the stroke of a bureaucrat's pen. Perceived legitimacy. You often hear that Putin is very popular. It's easy to be popular in the absence of an alternative. Putin's domination over the information sphere ensures that no one is allowed to appear to challenge him. We often talk about rigged elections when we talk about Russia, but even that is an understatement. It suggests the existence, the existence of a contest, but arcane regulations and doctoring of the numbers ensure that results are virtually always predictable. Navalny and his organization refuse to act out of fear. They have challenged Putin's monopoly on the media. They have also campaigned to consolidate the protest vote. The Kremlin has responded by attempting to murder and often jailing the army, by bringing charges against his closest allies, forcing many of them into exile, and most recently, by starting the process of designating all Navalny affiliated groups as extremist. This disqualifies members of these organizations from trying to get on the ballot and also threatens them with prison terms up to six years, 10 years for the leaders. Often descriptions such as this end with the conclusion that Putin's regime is weak. I don't want you to come away with that impression. Yes, Navalny personally, his supporters, mass protests, and independent media scare Putin. But this fear doesn't mean that the regime is vulnerable. It means, rather, that crackdown is the regime's animating force. It's lifeblood. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Gessen, and uh, certainly, uh, much of what we're concerned about uh, is happening in the journalistic field, and thank you for your work in that regard. And I'll turn to Dr. Weber. Uh, you're now recognized for your opening statement. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to submit a visual aid for the record. Uh, without objection, uh, we can display that as you begin your testimony. Thank you. Th thank you, Chairman Fitzpatrick, Ranking Member Keating, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. 
I'm excited to be with you because I have devoted my entire professional career to the study of Russia and defining peaceful understanding between our country and theirs. From 2012 to 2016, I lived in Russia, and there are many wonderful things to say about its culture, people, language, and nature. But I also experienced firsthand the grinding effects of authoritarianism and kleptocracy, people facing jail for trying to exercise their constitutional rights, and the best and brightest striking their fortunes abroad rather than having their businesses expropriated or limiting their ambitions. My testimony today is to describe the nature of power and politics in Russia, about which my written testimony goes into much greater detail. I'll conclude by describing avenues for U.S. policies to support peaceful democratic and economic change in Russia that are consistent with American values without putting individuals at risk, a serious concern in the current repressive environment. The picture there on the right side of your screen is from Vladimir Putin's latest inauguration in 2018. Unlike the joyous public events here in Washington or in many world capitals, the general public in Moscow is kept far away from such an event. Instead, the very top echelon of Russia's elite, its political, military, economic, and cultural leaders all fit into one very ornate room. Now, keep this picture in mind as I describe Putin the politician. Beyond the numerous malign acts ordered or sanctioned by Putin, with which we're all familiar, I'd like to answer a seemingly simple question. How has he held on to power for so long, and why does he seem to be in power for so much longer? The short answer is that practicing politics and representation in Russia means making sure there's enough authoritarianism and kleptocracy to keep the people in that room happy. The longer answer is in three parts. First, authoritarianism and kleptocracy are important tools for Putin because limiting the ability of regular Russians to participate in their country's political and economic life is the very mechanism by which Putin has held on to power for all this time. Second, Putin's hold on power is based on optimizing for stability and not growth. Those elites value Putin because he performs a critical service. He resolves their disputes so that they don't have to. Whenever those people have a problem with each other, they can go to him instead of fighting it out in parliament, in court, or with guns. Too much democracy or economic openness would limit Putin's ability to be useful because that would mean more constituencies to please and being less able to pick and choose winners in the economy. After all, according to Forbes magazine, Russia's 117 billionaires, the fifth highest in the world, control more than a third of Russia's entire GDP, the highest such percentage in the world. So Putin knows exactly whom to please. But it's not a one-way street. Those billionaires keep their positions because they are loyal, and they are called upon to repay the Russian state through funding military research and development, private military companies, social programs, and cultural endeavors. Finally, Putin wins, so to speak, when the Russian population and the outside world think he's so strong that change is impossible. He relies on a perception of inevitability that keeps everyone believing that no change is forthcoming. Good if you're in that room, and bad if you're not. Now, my written testimony goes into further detail. The power in Russia is practiced through two very different tasks, seizing and consolidating the formal levers of governance, and then keeping all the factions balanced so that no group can dominate others. Putin can continue indefinitely if his supporters believe that life without him is worse than life with him. In essence, if both supporters and opponents believe that the future looks like the present, then why bother changing anything? In the pictures on your screen, you see, in that sense, two great stereotypical images of Russia. On the bottom, nesting dolls, evoking Winston Churchill's famous description of the country. It is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. And on the right, probably my favorite picture about Russia, because it has a bear in the snow in front of the Kremlin with a fur hat, felt boots, and a flag around its shoulders while holding an AK-47 with a couple fighter jets above. These two pictures have everything you need to know about Putin's success as a politician, balancing all the elite factions, enforcing order upon the state through violence or the threat thereof, and defining a clear grand strategy, making Russia a great power by any means necessary, or else it'll all come crashing down without him. So what can the US Congress do? A lot, actually. First, in terms of authoritarianism, when I asked friends and colleagues in Russia for their advice on my testimony, the most pressing requests were not to forget about them because international attention is one of their primary defenses. To keep the names and individuals of individuals and organizations receiving U.S. government assistance private because the government there uses that to target people. And to help, honestly, with small bore stuff like subscriptions to paywalled media, professional tools, 
and professional development courses. In a broader sense, the surest long-term inoculation to authoritarianism is education. I would call upon the U.S. Congress to fund online educational services for students in Russia, such as spoken English lessons and preparation for standardized and college entrance exams, such as SAT, GRE, TOEFL, LSAT, AP tests. It would create positive interest in the United States, and given what we've experienced over the pandemic, we all now have the online learning figured out. Such a program would export education, one of our greatest assets, without having to send any money abroad. The other issue is kleptocracy. There are numerous acts that will be discussed later today, but the reason these measures are important is that the elites Putin needs to govern at home also want to take their money out of the country. As long as they can engage in all the capital flight they want, they have no incentive to change anything at home. That matters to them even more than sanctions, because Putin can compensate them for being sanctioned, but not for being unable to enjoy their money abroad. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weber, and, and thanks for underscoring the point, too, that today's hearing and much of what we talk about uh, is not about the Russian people themselves. Uh, we have an affinity for the Russian people themselves and their aspirational hopes, and part of the hearing is to try and bring some of that forth uh, so that they're aware uh, of the difference. So I really appreciate your underscoring that point, and I now uh, recognize uh, Mr. Uh, Grozev. Uh, for your opening statement. Mr. Grozev. Do, are you on mute? I think you have to unmute yourself. I hope I'm unmuted now. Uh, we can hear you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. In, the, in the last seven years, Bellingcat has investigated more than 15 previously unresolved crimes involving Russian suspects or Russian victims. In all of these cases, our analysis has shown that the crimes were commissioned, planned, and perpetrated by Russian security services. Many of the criminal incidents took place outside of Russian territory, involving either attempted assassinations or acts of sabotage, sometimes with collateral fatalities. Most of these unlawful extraterritorial operations were conducted by Russia's military intelligence, known as the GRU. They included the blowing up of ammunition depots in, the, in Czechia in late 2014 that left two Czech civilians dead, assassination attempts on the Bulgarian arms manufacturer Emelian Gebrev and two other Bulgarian citizens in 12, uh, 2015, explosions at the range of Bulgarian weapons depots, storing weapons earmarked for export to Georgia and Ukraine, and the Novichok poisoning of Sergei and Yulia Skripal, as well as Don Sturges in the UK in uh, uh, 2018. All of these assassinations and terrorist acts were the actions of a secretive subunit of the GRU's unit 29155, that reports directly to the director of the GRU and to the Kremlin. The operatives of this unit received Russia's highest military award, the Hero of Russia, in the immediate wake of these explosions and assassination attempts. We have identified more than 30 members of this black, black ops operation who in the past decade have traveled to hundreds on hundreds of trips across Europe and the world under government-issued fictitious identities. However, our investigations have shown that the GRU by far does not have a uh, monopoly on Russian extrajudicial extra assassinations abroad. In uh, 2019, Bellingcat and our investigative partners discovered evidence that linked Russia's other security agency, the FSB, to the murder of a Georgian citizen, Zelenhan Kangushili, in Berlin in August 2019. This investigation allowed us to solve a string of other cold cases involving assassinations of other victims, all Russian or ex-Soviet nationals, whom the Russian authorities had labeled terrorists or separatists. In the course of these investigations, we uncovered also a sprawling proxy structure conducting overseas operations on behalf of the FSB, the second service of the FSB, which is called, non-ironically, the Service for Fight Against Terrorism and Extremism. This proxy structure is hidden within the so-called Vintel Group companies, which masquerades as a private security group owned by former FSB officers, but in fact serves as a deniable assassination squad doing the FSB's bidding. Like with the GRU Black Ops operatives, members of this assassination squad got highest uh, military awards from Russia and travel on government-issued identities around the world. Apart from these extraterritorial sabotage and assassination programs, we've uncovered the existence of a domestic assassination program run by the same second service of the FSB, often in collaboration with another FSB entity, the Technical and Scientific Service, which provides assistance in deploying chemical weapons and masking the traces of their use. It was these two FSB units which 
based on multiple mutually corroborating data points, appear to have planned and perpetrated the Novichok poisonings of Alexei Navalny in August 2020. Our follow-up investigation found that members of the same cross-functional FSB team that poisoned Navalny had been systematically tailing other, at least five other na Russian nationals who were ultimately poisoned with unidentified chemicals, at least three of whom died. Members of this FSB unit were always in the vicinity of the victim in the hours or days before they fell into a coma or died from multiple organ fa failure in unexplained circumstances. The victims included political opposition figures like Vladimir Karamurza, who was targeted and poisoned at least twice, as well as other outspoken Russian journalists and human rights activists. Our investigation also uncovered the existence of a clandestine Russian program of development and synth synthesis of banned toxins and nerve agents carefully designed to circumvent and disguise Russia's non-compliance with its obligation to terminate its chemical weapons program under the Chemical Weapons Convention. This program, which we believe is centered around a government-run signal institute in Moscow, provides cover employment for Russia's leading military scientists who previously worked for Russia's military chemical weapons program. Dozens of these scientists continue working in a distributed manner under the guise of civilian research in a cluster of state-owned private labs. Um, Telephone metadata obtained by us established persistent communication patterns between these labs and members of the jury and the FSB poison squads, which peak just before known poisoning operations. Uh, last, I would like to end with the fact that um, there seems to be a gap, in, a gaping hole in law enforcement internationally, we've discovered, because none of these terrorist uh, and extrajudicial operations we've, uh, we've identified have been prosecuted properly simply because of the current system of the law enforcement that requires the cooperation of nation states uh, in providing legal assistance. This system simply does not work when one of the countries that is supposed to provide legal aid is the perpetrator. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Groza, for the rather chilling uh, remarks. Um, I'll now turn to Mr. Lucas. You're now recognized for your opening statement. Thank you. Chairman Keating, Ranking Member Fitz Fitzpatrick, distinguished members, it's an honour to be able to share my thoughts with the committee on this vitally important topic. I'm going to summarise my written testimony and then look forward to your questions. I've spent all my adult life dealing with this region. I lived behind the Iron Curtain. I lived in um, post-communist Russia and other places. And I yearn for the time when the Russian people will live in freedom and prosperity and at peace with their neighbours. But that day is a long way off. I strongly endorse uh, my friend and colleague Masha Gesson's testimony and that of my fellow witnesses. I am going to concentrate for my, in my remarks on the external picture, the interaction of the Kremlin kleptocracy with the West. And I have to tell you, for now, we're losing. And we're losing, losing because our adversaries understand something about our society better than we do. They understand that they can attack us using money and by abusing the freedoms that are inherent in our system. And Nord Stream is a great example of that. Sell cheap gas, buy political influence, and it's not against the law. And because of the greed and complacency, not just in Germany, but also in my country, the United Kingdom and elsewhere, we are not willing to defend ourselves. We could defend ourselves, and I give details in my written testimony about what we could do with different legal and normative instruments, but we don't. And there's a real paradox here, because it was the free market capitalist system that enabled us to beat communism. It brought us prosperity and dynamism. Democracy works better than dictatorship. The same economic system that triumphed over communism is losing to kleptocracy, because it allows our enemies to buy political influence and use that to attack our decision making when they're inside our system they also use the rights and freedoms given by our political system and the our courts to intimidate their critics we have to understand the threat and then make the changes necessary to put on our alliances first now russia is not the only problem here but it's a great place to start because it combined combines both a kleptocratic system and a geopolitical threat Russia uses um, its money and its influence um, far beyond what just 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 the, 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 what a, a rich person has, and they have access 
to state resources. They can run disinformation campaigns to demoralize and distract Western societies. They can use cyber and intelligence means to surveil and harass whistleblowers and anti-corruption campaigners, investigative journalists. They can apply diplomatic pressure to protect their wealth, conduct physical intimidation campaigns, including abductions, like the one we just saw over Belarus, assaults and assassinations. Now, many people say, well, hang on, isn't China the big threat? One hears that a lot these days. And it's true that China is far more important than Russia when it comes to global, go global economic governance. But it's still the case. The Kremlin is the biggest source of instability on Europe's borders. It's the biggest source of interference inside democratic societies. It funds extremist parties spreads disinformation and as you mentioned in your opening remarks russian pipelines don't just export natural gas they export corruption germany is a weak country because of its energy dependence on russia it's also a weaker member of nato and that means that the united states has to bear a bigger burden how we send deal with russia's kleptocracy sent an important signal to China's leaders. If we can't deal with Russia, a stagnant country with an Italy-sized economy, then what chance have we of dealing with the biggest country in the world, China? And China takes advantage of the economic, legal, political, and social vulnerabilities that are created and exploited by the Kremlin. Now, what do we do about this? We need a whole of government approach, we need a whole of society approach, and we need an international approach. The, kleptoc the, the tentacles of kleptocracy are global. Um, and our responses, as Christo mentioned, are national. Now, we can do this. No tanks crunched down Wall Street, forcing us to open our financial system to our enemies. We did that to ourselves because we're complacent, naive and greedy. Well, we can undo that. It's, it's kryptonite for kleptocrats and we have it in our hands. And just finally, I want to say, speaking from outside the United States, we really appreciate the lead you're taking. The Caucus Against Foreign Corruption, the Crook Act, the Foreign Extortion Prevention Act, the Repel Act, the Trap Act. These are templates for us in the rest of the world. And I yearn for the day when my country will not be seen as the global headquarters of money laundering. Um, we are, it's, it's a source of great shame to me that the City of London is the, the kleptocrat's best friend. I look forward to your questions and thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. And uh, I want to uh, recognize members for five minutes each and pursuant to House rules, all time yielded is for the purposes of questioning our witnesses because of the virtual format of the hearing. I'll recognize members by committee seniority alternating between uh, Democrats and Republicans. If you missed your turn, please let our staff know and we'll circle back to you. If you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally. Uh, I'll now start by recognizing myself for five minutes. You know, there have been numerous uh, public reports regarding microwave attacks on Americans working for the government, both overseas here uh, and abroad. Uh, Mr. Grozev, uh, with your background and experience, can you give any details about any specific threats posed by the GRU and SBR uh, to the United States and to individuals working uh, for our government? Uh, what research have you conducted on, if any, uh, on these type of microwave attacks and their potential usage by Russian security services and any history that Russia had uh, in using these type of tactics? Mr. Groza, you can lead. And then anyone else that wants to uh, comment after that? Mr. Groza? Uh, you're muted, I believe. Yes, no, I'm muted. So um, I would like to answer by saying that we are currently investigating together with our investigative partners um, from other media, the series of uh, sonic or microwave attacks that took place uh, across several uh, consular sections around the world, including the United States. We're not, we haven't completed our investigation, so I would not like to uh, provide a final judgment on that. However, I would say that in our uh, investigation of the activities of the GRU, and in particular of their medical and scientific unit, which part of it is based in, in St. Petersburg at the um, at a institute called the Institute for Experimental Biology. We see that the GRU had a particular interest in a particular um, type of uh, technology um, that um, impacts, that can impact the human capacity to uh, operate, the brain's capacity to operate under the duress of uh, particular uh, sound waves. 
And we've seen this, uh, we've seen that there is a communication between the GRU and a particular institute um, called the Applied Acoustics Institute, which is in the domain of the um, uh, Ministry of Defense. Uh, whether that exactly is the program that uh, has resulted in these uh, sonic attacks, we are not uh, at, at this point uh, ready to, to apply. However, what is clear is that the GRU have looked at that and that also the GRU um, have um, a tendency to look into innovative, from their point of view, um, weapons uh, that, that can affect uh, the human brain. And this may be one of them. Do any of our other witnesses want to comment on that? Uh, if not, uh, I'll just like to ask uh, something that's been broached upon uh, in all your opening remarks and your written testimony, that we have to take a broader view of how we deal uh, with these Russian threats and malign activities, uh, looking at it. And, and I think the opening statements our, our witnesses have made really covered a lot of ground in that respect. And one of them in particular, however, uh, draws the U.S., and Mr. Lucas mentioned this in particular, but uh, draws the U.S. Uh, to really reflect on its own ability to control uh, what occurs throughout our own country and our institutions here. And that's the idea that uh, in order for Putin to maintain his authority, uh, as has been referenced in the uh, opening testimony of our witnesses, he has to appease and please uh, oligarchs and elites. That's who his audience is that keeps him in power. Uh, and it's important, as was mentioned in the testimony, that they, uh, from their perspective, that they have the ability globally to use their wealth and resources. And so uh, when you look at uh, Western countries, uh, UK, and you look at the US, uh, we, in fact, are facilitating some of this money laundering and, and covering up of assets. Uh, can, can you really stress what we can do about that here? Uh, you mentioned some of the legislation, but some of your own opinions, how vital that is in terms of U.S. response. Mr. Lucas. Uh, thank you, sir. There's a theory that one could destabilize the Putin regime by putting pressure on the oligarchs. I have to say that we've, we've tested that. It doesn't seem to have worked. Um, and the, the, the oligarchs close to Putin have um, you know, clustered around him rather than trying to um, do anything against him. But in a way, that's not the point. The point is this is important for our system. You know, we need to keep dirty money out of our politics, out of our decision making. And it's good for us whether or not it um, has an effect on Putin. Uh, I think that the, the key thing is corporate anonymity. And it's really important. This register of beneficial ownership is an absolute masterstroke by the United States. It's really important that it's implemented properly. And I hope that members of your committee will be really holding the US Treasury and FinCEN's feet to the fire, making sure this is implemented in a, in a broad and effective way. And then that you put pressure on other countries and say, hey, you do the same. Because sunlight's the best disinfectant. When we see who owns stuff, then we can start asking question, other questions about it. I agree. I, th I think it's important to work with our allies in this regard, but not to wait for uh, our allies to move on this. We have the ability ourselves to move on that. So I thank you. My time has expired and I recognize uh, the ranking member, Mr. Fitzpatrick, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first question uh, for Mr. Lucas. Um, in your testimony, you note that uh, Russian pipelines uh, do not just export energy dependence on Russia, but also export corruption. Um, can you elaborate, uh, sir, on how the Nord Stream 2 pipeline will enable the Kremlin to export corruption into Europe and the consequences of this to both the United States and our European interests? Thank you, sir. It's a great question. And I would commend the work of Ilya Zas Zaslavsky, who's written two excellent reports on the politics of, of Nord Stream. And I'll be happy to send those to your um, staff after the after after the hearing so you can um, look at the more detail there are many elements to this one is that pipeline gas creates monopoly once you, once the pipeline is built the gas that comes through the pipeline will be cheaper than for example bringing it in from uh, by liquefied in liquefied natural gas form from from tankers so not pipelines are inherently monopolistic and one needs a legal framework in order to prevent that and the Kremlin is guilty in court of abusing its um, gas pipelines, which are a legacy of the Soviet Union, to try and distort the um, the gas market in Western Europe. And the EU did a pretty good job of pushing back against that, but the job's not done. Um, 
particularly with regard to Germany. Nord Stream 2 makes Germany a weaker ally for the United States, and that means the United States has to carry even more of the water in European security. And that's a, that's, that's a big issue. It's something that every US administration has complained about. Nord Stream makes that worse. But it also, as you said in your question, it exports corruption. And the best example of that is the role of the former German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, um, who is the chairman of the consortium that is in charge of the, of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline and is building the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Pipeline. But it's not just that. That's the kind of conspicuous tip of the iceberg. Once you have um, this bastion of economic influence in the German system, then you have all the jobs and sinecures and contracts that go with it. And we see the way in which German politicians have friends and relatives who are put onto the payroll of the um, Russia-related uh, energy companies. And it creates a sort of web of interest and obligation, um, which pumps um, a, a sort of pro-Kremlin mindset and pro-Kremlin views and pro-Kremlin actions into the heart of the German, the German system. Um, it's amazing and commendable to me that so many Germans are now fed up with this and perhaps the um, disquiet in Germany about fossil fuel dependency and worries about human rights in Russia and elsewhere is helping this. Um, but I think that the, 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 the Gazprom lobby in Germany is to some extent on the, on the back foot. But boy, if they had a good run over the last 20 years, um, Germans have benefited from this in cheap gas. Everyone else has paid a price for it in terms of security, not least in Ukraine, which of course would be the great loser if um, Nord Stream 2 is built and gas transit through Ukraine finishes. And there's a real paradox here that American taxpayers and American servicemen are trying to defend Europe and greedy German, um, the greedy German energy lo lobby is working on the other, on the, in the other direction. And I'm really sorry that sanctions have been dropped on Nord Stream and I hope it's not too late um, to reimpose them and, and, and to try and put a stake through the heart of this project. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. I want to uh, shift briefly to China. Uh, in your testimony, you assess the that China is taking advantage of the economic, legal, political, and social vulnerabilities that have long been created and exploited by the Kremlin. Uh, sir, can you go into more detail and provide some, some concrete examples? And what, what can we do on this committee and in Congress to address these vulnerabilities of the Russia-China issue? Well, it's really interesting to compare and contrast um, Chinese and, and Russian tactics. And I worry that the Chinese are learning from um, from, from the Russians, particularly in the realm of um, of lawfare. But we see, for example, supply chain defect dependency, the use of um, access to the market, the, the access to the Chinese market is far more important than access to the Russian market, but Russia pioneered the sort of targeted use of sanctions against countries it didn't like, and now China's doing the same against the great US ally of Australia. Um, we also see a much more powerful Chinese presence on campus. This is something the Russians tried, didn't get um, very far on, but the, uh, the attempt to try and intimidate um, academic discussion, it, China, China is very effective, effective on that. Um, Russia's pioneered the use of intimidatory lawsuits, like the, these so-called slaps, um, but I think China is going to be moving in the, in, in, in the same direction. Um, so we, but we, we, it, it's almost like a hole in the roof. You've got a hole in the roof, rain will get through one day, wind will get through the next. The key thing is to first of all fix the hole in the roof. And we can do this. And it was, what's so frustrating, nobody made us do this. We chose to open our system up in a way that the um, Russian and Chinese adversaries can attack us. Thank you, sir. Uh, my time's expired. Uh, Mr. Chairman, are you back? Thank you. The chair now recognizes the vice chair of the committee, Representative Spanberger, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And to the witnesses, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's unfortunate that we have seen far too many examples in recent years of the negative consequences of the authoritarianism and corruption in Russia. Consequences that, of course, deeply impact the Russian people, but also the security, uh, the democracy, and human rights internationally. Uh, and this destructive behavior of the Kremlin has, in fact, directly affected Americans, whether it be the safety of our troops abroad, the security of our elections, or our cybersecurity and government infrastructure. And so I'd like to begin by question by providing questions that relate to some of the motivating factors here, um, and that's the, the, uh, the proliferation of illicit finance and uh, the corruption that really uh, fuels some of this malign influence and malign efforts. Like so many other members of this committee, I am concerned about how Putin and his collaborators do utilize illicit finance and corruption to advance their own aims uh, while repressing their own people, weakening human rights and security internationally. And so along these lines, I, I did lead an effort 
uh, with nearly 40 of my colleagues calling uh, for a significant increase to the U.S. Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, so that we, the United States, can better go after money laundering and illicit transactions that underlie some of these criminal, corrupt, or dangerous behavior that we see from states like Russia and uh, non-state actors who take refuge in the country. And so, uh, Mr. Rosev, I would like to begin with you and ask very generally, you know, what is known about the role of Russian oligarchs in financing um, illicit activities and, and operations? And can you speak to the strategy of how they finance some of these activities, um, in, including the links between the oligarchs, the actual government, and, and perhaps transnational actors? Um, and then what loopholes the oligarchs might exploit in international financial systems to carry out these activities or to secure their own wealth? Thank you. That's a very good question. And um, I have to say that something I always caution against is uh, seeing Russia or the Russian autocracy as a uh, centralized planned economy. The equivalent um, is much more closer to, uh, to an actual marketplace of uh, of, uh, of, 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 of operations that are disruptive. And in that marketplace, a lot of oligarchs offer their services and they offer their innovation as well in exchange for uh, funding or for solution of, or solving of other problems that they have. We can take a couple of examples uh, just to make it more, more vivid. Um, at the start of the war in Ukraine, um, it was a particular oligarch, a Russian oligarch, con uh, his name is Konstantin Malofeev, who took the initial risk of sending some of his proxies, um, a mini army financed by him on his own account, um, and delivered um, what turned out to be a pretty successful operation to the Kremlin, uh, whereby he solved a lot of legal issues that he had themselves. There was a criminal case um, pending against him. There was a, a large debt that he had accumulated um, towards one of the state banks. All of that debt vanished, uh, disappeared after he delivered the result. Now, this is an example of the interplay between um, an oligarch and the Kremlin. The Kremlin has only a limited number of assets that they can share with, with the oligarchs, but that includes solving legal problems. That includes giving them access to, uh, to new resources and, and resources such as, I mean, Crimea was, was, an, uh, was a large resource that was acquired, it was stolen by Russia, but a lot of the licenses, concessions, access to raw resources were given to some of the oligarchs as part of a trading deal. Another oligarch who has been in a similar position offering such deniable services uh, of international disruption is Yevgeny Prigozhin. I mean, you, you know him because he did uh, take part in disrupting your elections in uh, 2018 at least. And um, uh, he's, he's funding a, a private army and he's being funded himself for that operation through large state contracts that are awarded to his uh, catering companies that that provide services food and beverage services and other logistical services to the army so it's a vicious circle in this particular case it's not legal solutions that are offered by the kremlin but actually um they have a sort of symbiotic relationship where they're giving him uh, a over they're allowing him to overcharge for the logistical services in order for him to deliver this deniable proxy arrangement so these are just two examples and there are many more uh, that i'm sure my colleagues can also speak to and, and do you and, and anyone else on the call, do you have recommendations for what we, uh, Congress or the Biden administration could do uh, that could potentially, um, you know, much of what you just described is occurring domestically within Russia, um, but are, are there any things that we could do to close loopholes um, or cut off some of the, the tools that they use in, in this illicit finance or movement of money? Well, I, I think um, we, you have to be inventive and you have to sort of uh, come to the, uh, the to, to the challenge. And one of the uh, ways to be inventive is to actually make it difficult for people with whom these oligarchs trade and uh, trade also privately, not necessarily commercially. I mean, uh, Evgeny Prigozhin and his family are uh, very avid. Uh, um, uh, they have racing horses in, in several countries around Europe. And uh, well, this is an example of continued um, operation and, and commercial transactions between the family and, and, and people in Europe or people in the United States. So it's, essentially it has to be a very good intelligence work trying to find out what are the spheres of, of private lives that these people would feel affected by if they lose them. Uh, but that would be about the only way that I can think at this point. Thank you very much, sir. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative. The chair now recognizes uh, Representative Wagner for 
five minutes. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for organizing this important hearing, and I thank the witnesses for their tireless work to shed light on Russia's corrupt and illicit practices, especially its egregious human rights abuses. As the State Department documented in its 2020 Human Rights Report, Putin's Russia has engaged in extrajudicial killings, disappearances, torture, wrongful arrests, attempted assassinations, and persecution of religious minorities. The United States should honor the many victims of the autocratic Putin regime, including the unjustly imprisoned opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, by holding Putin and his cronies accountable for the crimes that they have committed against their own people. Dr. Weber, what has been the effect of Alexei Navalny's poisoning and imprisonment on civil society? And to what extent has it changed the way the Russian public views the Russian government? And also, how, how can the United States best support those who are continuing to stand up to Putin, Dr. Weber? Thank you. That's a, that's an excellent question. Um, so, you know, for for many years, the the Russian leadership didn't say Alexei Navalny's name in public. They would use such uh, constructions as uh, a blogger that nobody needs, the Berlin patient, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, what we can see in the past couple of months is that they've taken a lot of money and is and essentially raised the amount of repression over the entire society just to uh, illustrate the fact that they're not terribly bothered by him. And it's clear that in that what Alexei Navalny represents to them that is such a threat is that he's a political alternative. He may be a good alternative for president, a bad alternative for president. The fact that he, that people can think of him as an alternative to Putin, that's the main threat that he poses. And so that's why they've taken him, you know, in and out of prison, poisoned him. Uh, and what they've done right now is, uh, as has been mentioned earlier, they have labeled his entire organization or gone through the political steps to, or the legal steps to call his organization an extremist one. So at the same level as ISIS within Russia, that's how much of a threat the idea of political alternatives um, are. And, um, you know, there was a previous question from Representative Spanberger that touches upon an, an aspect of this, that what Putin wants is all of these different you know, oligarchs or security services or whatever else, all of these different groups to think that Putin is going to basically keep increasing their funding, their money indefinitely into the future. That's why they support him. That's why he supports them. But it's a relationship that's, uh, in fact, kind of futile. They, he also expects Thank them you. to provide Thank services. Thank you, Dr. Weber. I, Thank you. I appreciate it. I need to move on. For decades, uh, the American media service Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty our RFERL has been a key part of U.S. efforts to share stories of freedom and democracy with millions of people around the world. Today, the Kremlin is working to compromise RFERL's ability to expose the truth of dangerous propaganda and disinformation campaigns propagated by totalitarian, pardon me, regimes like Russia. Mr. Lucas, how can RFERLs fight uh, the Russian government's efforts to limit and control its operations? And what more, can, again, can the United States do to assist both uh, in maintaining Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty's presence in the ground in Russia and to support freelancers facing the consequences of Putin's assault on freedom of the press? Well, Thank you, ma'am. It's, it's a great question. And if there was an easy answer, we'd have it. Um, I, th this is a point of vulnerability for us. We want to do things inside Russia. And when we're inside Russia, we are vulnerable to pressure from the um, Russian authorities. I think you know, so long as Russians can still travel abroad, we can do stuff there. We can support um, news organizations that um, train abroad. We can support people coming abroad. We can um, support organizations like Medusa. Um, Unless they put up a great firewall of Russia, like we have a great firewall of China, 
um, we can operate on a pool model where Russians are finding stuff on the internet. It won't be broadcast in the con in the conventional sense. Um, I still have a hankering for shortwave radio, but that perhaps is my um, <laughs> says something about my generation. Um, some of us on this call may remember the joys of shortwave radio. Uh, but the key thing, ma'am, is we've got to want to do it. We've got to believe that we have a story to tell, and we've got yeah. to feel that it matters to get that story across. Because when we stop believing in in our values and our message, then what chance is there of anyone else believing it in either? I, I couldn't agree more. I thank you for your answer. Um, I yield back, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again for the hearing. Well, thank you, Representative. The chair now recognizes uh, Representative Cicilline for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the ranking member for calling this uh, important hearing, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, the influence of Russia and its leadership under the long rule of Vladimir Putin on global democratic backsliding and corrupt government, governance cannot be overstated. For over two decades, Putin has enriched himself and has enriched a tiny circle of elites through global money laundering schemes that harm democracy in the West, compromise critical markets around the world, and ensures that Putin is isolated from criticism and political opposition. And unfortunately, in America and in places around the world, a cottage industry has arisen to service the needs of Russia's corrupt elite that seek to hide and launder dark money. And so my first question is for you, Mr. Lucas, you know, as we think about what Congress can do, you reference in your written testimony, uh, the ter use the term enablers, bankers, lawyers, accountants, real estate agents, and other members of the professional class in North America and Europe and beyond that are all too happy to service the needs of Russia through corrupt financial practices. And what can we do here in the United States and along with our partners to ensure that that doesn't continue? Well, there's a, it's, it's a very broad problem, and but you've got to start somewhere. And the United States, as the most important, um, foremost democracy in the world, the biggest capitalist economy, is a great place to start. And this legislation before Congress, and in fact, the legislation was already passed, is a good jumping off point. Because one of the great things about the United States is people are scared of doing things that will get them into trouble in the United States. It was very interesting just now on social media, someone pointed out that there may have been some American citizens on board that flight that was brought and uh, forced to land in Belarus. And that's just a game changer. If it uses a single US cent or a single US person involved, then suddenly it's, a, it's, it's, it's different from if you're just mucking around in Cyprus or Luxembourg or one of these other jurisdictions that the Russians also exploit. So, that, so that's, it's, it's really important for the United States to confidently take the lead. And I think you, there's two big things here. One is to go after corporate anonymity insist that you know where the money comes from. Um, don't just say, allow people to say this is a shell company and it's buying business real estate and it's only re residential real estate that's covered by FinCEN. So FinCEN's rules on real estate have got to go. Mr. Up. Lucas, I'm, just, I'm going to try to get a couple more questions. So I, sure. I, I just, I, yeah, no, I, I get your point. I guess, um, and I think we have some legislation before the committee that I hope will move forward yeah. in a bipartisan way. Uh, I want to now turn to Professor Gesson. You, uh, I'd like if you would to speak for a moment about the impact of uh, this autocratic rule in Russia and particularly during COVID-19 and how it has impacted uh, human rights, particularly for women, girls and members of the LGBTQI community uh, and kind of what's happening on the ground. Well, as I mentioned, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, Russia is a country that is uniquely positioned to vaccinate its population and this hasn't happened. And in fact, we're seeing you know, we've lost count, is it the second or third wave of uh, COVID deaths in Russia, and deaths are vastly underestimated. Um, to answer your question about women, girls, and the LGBT community, I think one of the things uh, that have that has impacted people a lot is the isolation, the de facto isolation of Russia. Russians have effectively lost the ability to travel abroad um, and to leave the country, this for LGBT people, for women and girls facing abuse, um, means cutting off a lifeline, right? Uh, we have seen so many um, refugees and asylum seekers coming out of Russia, especially as a result of sort of this so-called traditional values, anti-LGBT campaign, and that has effectively stopped in the last year and a half. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Weber, you spoke about the importance of partnering with 
Russian pro-democracy and pro-reform forces. And of course, the challenge is how we do that in a way that doesn't endanger the very lives of the people engaged in this work. And so you talk about some online courses, but are there other things we can do to sort of get the story out about the way that this Russian kleptocracy is destroying the lives for ordinary Russians and that, you know, Vladimir Putin and his cronies are, you know, robbing the treasures of this great country at the to, to the detriment of the Russian people. And it feels like that's a big part of the untold story. And how do we effectively do that? So great. I mean, one of the things that, you know, these sorts of organizations, when I was reaching out to them, they said things like, you know, a subscription to Adobe Photoshop or other editing software, really small things like that, because what the Russian government has gone after is the investigative news journalists inside of Russia. So these are Russian journalists and activists who want to talk about their own country in their own language. And so that's the support that they need. They basically need the spotlight from abroad and the tools to actually do their jobs. That's their core um, desires. And you know, an evacuation plan if it really goes pear-shaped. Got it. Thank you. Uh, my time is just right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Chair recognizes Representative Meyer, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our our, our witnesses who are here today. Um, you know, obviously, we've been watching over the past two decades, and I think we have this this kind of nagging feeling of of a window slowly starting to close that had been opened um, after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. But uh, you know, I guess um, there's a number of, of reasons to be pessimistic, and um, I think Dr. Lucas, you mentioned. Uh, some some room for optimism in terms of greater transparency on, on on property purchases, right, or other areas where beneficial ownership uh, can be achieved. Um, and and there are still those those green shoots on the activist front. Um, Alexei Navalny being one, but obviously, as, as we all know, that whole path has really just gotten gotten beaten down. Um, Professor Gesson, I I wanted to turn to you and and your testimony. You mentioned um, the the kind of dark joke um, of, of you know, modern Russia being two uh, crayfish turning to one another and, and saying, you know, 10, de 10, 10 degrees ago, it wasn't so bad. And that, that you know, slowly boiling pot of water. Um, if, if you were uh, a, a pro-democracy activist or an anti-Putin activist today, um, that isn't already associated with, with Alexei Navalny or an existing movement. I mean, is there, is there any room for that to grow that hasn't any soil that hasn't been, been kind of salted by the regime? That's a great question. And I think, uh, I think if you're looking for reasons for optimism, I'm not going to give you any, uh, I think it's, it's a scorched earth situation. I mean, we, uh, the, um, the vector of the regime is, is to, kill everything in on site and um and the crack the the scale and brutality of the crackdown that we have seen just in the last few weeks is unprecedented we've said this before um but this just shows that yes there's 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 room for this to get much much worse and it's getting exponentially worse just in the last few weeks the um the extremist designation <clears throat> which a couple of us have mentioned uh that um that has uh, that has been uh, is going to be applied to Navalny's organizations, opens up room for a scale of arrests and uh, the kind of prison terms that we simply have not seen before. And um, that, yeah, I, I guess looking for optimism maybe maybe an overly optimistic um, assessment. I, I know we saw some some mass protests or at least a. A decline, I shouldn't say mass protests, we saw some isolated ones, but a decline in, in, in Putin's popularity um, when he was implementing some retirement reforms uh, a few years ago. I mean, is there still room outside of the pro-democracy, you know, kind of pro-Putin outside of that, that dynamic? Um, are there other areas where there may be simmering discontent that um, could you know, undermine um, that hold. You know, I, we talked about the oligarchs earlier, and then and that, that targeting. You know, they kind of, um, you know, circle the horses or circle the wagons, if you will. Um, you know, when it comes to other elements of the civil society that aren't necessarily engaged in the democracy advocacy front. Um, you know, where is the the Putin standing at the moment? Right. I think, Representative Meyer, you're asking me if there's a way for the Russian people to bring down the Putin regime, and I think the answer is no. 
not because there's no discontent, there's a lot of discontent, um, but because all the levers that could possibly be set in motion by, uh, by mass discontent, by mass protest, have long since been destroyed. There's no independent judiciary, there's no possibility of independent political action by any people who have official power. Um, there's nothing for protest, no, there's nothing for, for, there's no way to express the discontent publicly except by going out into the streets and going out into the streets meets with a more and more brutal crackdown every time it happens. Thank you, Professor. And, and Dr. Lucas, real quick before uh, my time expires, uh, you know, obviously we we touched upon earlier the Ryanair flight that was kind of air piracy, you know, and, and forced to land in Belarus. Um, and then just today we had an Air France flight from Paris to Moscow that was told if it wasn't going to transit Belarusian airspace, it wouldn't be allowed to land in Moscow. Um, any any insight into how you view this escalating tension with um, with with Minsk getting closer to to Moscow um, and, and forming kind of that authoritarian alliance? How does that play out for the rest of the EU? I think that uh, Moscow is pretty surprised about what Minsk did. I don't think it was part of a plan. Um, I wonder if Putin will tell Lukashenko to back down and then present that as a, a gift wrapped um, something for the table at the, the summit with Biden. But um, if I knew the answer, I would be running some intelligence organization. I wouldn't be here. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Representative. Chair recognizes Representative Titus for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to these witnesses. You know, we've heard a lot this morning about how Putin and the oligarchs of Russia have used their wealth to kind of control or maintain a stranglehold on the internal economy and politics of Russia itself. But we also know they've used these funds in turn to influence politics around them. They've uh, supported separatist movements in Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova. They've tried to influence elections in some of their the countries that are near their sphere of influence. They interfered in the referendum in Macedonia even. Uh, I wonder if the panel would discuss what the United States can do to try to stop that extended influence without playing into the hands of Putin, who actually needs the U.S. to be an enemy to build up his position internally. So, ma'am, if I may, I would suggest um, better enforcement of secondary sanctions. So a lot of these oligarchs and different sorts of people, they provide some service to the Putin and the Russian state, but they also have totally normal business dealings. And so there isn't any real reputational risk of dealing with those people because they can say, you know, this is my one state business, but I have all my other business that's totally normal. So to increase the risk, the reputational risk of working with them on other people, that would be the sort of thing that could raise the costs uh, to basically business as normal uh, within Russia and would then essentially create these, um, these long-term you know, doubts within the elite. Do I want to participate in trying to influence a referendum in Montenegro or wherever else if I can't also have my normal, you know, stock listing in, you know, New York or London or Hong Kong or wherever else? So that would be a core thing to raise the costs on the elites from inside of Russia through secondary sanctions. If I may, yeah, can I jump in? Uh, if I may be so bold as to suggest that we think about sanctions a little bit differently. Um, I think the traditional way of thinking about sanctions is to try to measure their effectiveness and see if um, if they've actually changed the behavior of, of somebody like Putin. Um, I think that's unrealistic. Putin's behavior is not going to change, nor is the propaganda machine going to stop positioning the United States, no matter what the United States does as the enemy. As you rightly pointed out, that is what Putin needs for the survival of his propaganda machine. Um, I think if we could reframe it as doing the right thing, mm -hmm. as not do, as as the right thing be, being not doing business with a regime that kills its own citizens, that throws people in jail for thought crimes, uh, that has assassination squads roaming the world, that uh, that interferes in other countries and works to undermine other democracies, um, then I think that question becomes a little bit simpler. Right? It's not a question of effectiveness. It's a question of maintaining the integrity of the West, maintaining the, integ the integrity of U.S. actors and not getting in bed with that regime. Thank you. 
Thank you. If I could uh, just just jump in. Yes, um, go right ahead. Yeah, yes, um, it, it, it's absolutely right. Maintain the, the best defense we have is the integrity of our system. Um, the greatest weakness we have is problems in our system, which enemies can exploit. I just want to say we, we've already done this with terrorist finance. If I said to you 30 years ago, we we're going to worry about how um, Islamic extremists um, handled money. People said, why is that a problem? 9-11 taught us that's a big problem. And we've dealt with it. We have very sophisticated, extensive um, measures for dealing with threat finance. We just need to refocus that a bit and start thinking not just about terrorists, but about kleptocracies. Thank you. Just really quickly, what's something that hasn't been mentioned is environmental progress in Russia. You know, often the way oligarchs or leaders get away with things is a lack of rule of law or a lack of regulation. Uh, is that occurring in Russia too, where Putin says one thing and yet we don't have any way to hold them accountable, accountable for anything that's uh, improving the environment like the Paris Accord? Professor, you're smiling. The law in Russia is very flexible. So it's, um, <laughs> there are many laws and regulations that are in conflict with each other and they get interpreted as, as is necessary. So the way the Russians view climate change writ large is quickly enough is they look at the, basically China saying, you know, President Xi said, we'll reach maximum coal usage in 2035, but we'll be carbon neutral in 2060. The U.S. is sort of in and out they look at that as if the other two major players of the system aren't taking this very consistently and very seriously, they look at climate change as actually good for them. It's better growing seasons inside of Russia, which is a cold country. Um, it's greater access to the mineral resources in the Arctic itself. And if the Arctic becomes a navigable zone, well, then they can militarize it and make it something in which they are a, a founding member of the Arctic as something to negotiate with the United States and others akin to nuclear weapons. So they're actually all in on climate change as being a good thing. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, representatives. Uh, we'll just take a, a few moments to uh, do some follow-up or some areas that weren't covered uh, for the members that want to participate. At least I have a few. Um, we really have touched on Crimea uh, just to uh, Yesterday, I, I had a conversation with several of the reform leaders in Ukraine. Uh, as they move forward, and they realize their challenges, but they are moving forward, I believe, uh, working on areas of judicial reform, uh, uh, dealing with corruption issues in Ukraine. You know, their aspirational goal is to move towards, uh, you know, the EU, or maybe NATO. Uh, as Russia amasses anywhere between 80,000, maybe more, troops uh, just for a show of force. As they go along this, what do you anticipate Putin's move will be? We know what happened the last time in the Medan after, uh, you know, they were moving towards, uh, you know, a, a application towards the EU and Russia's response. What do you anticipate the problems there uh, for Ukraine moving forward? What intervention do you think uh, Putin is capable of going forward now? Shall I answer that? Go ahead, well, Mr. Lucas. Yes, I, mean, I, I think the key thing for Russia is that Ukraine has become a much stronger country now. This is not the Ukraine of 2014, which was basically unable to defend itself. And the thought of an all-out war with Ukraine, even if it didn't have Western help, is, is, is a really serious prospect for Russia. So I think that we are in an era of bluff and intimidation. Um, rather than outright conflict, and Russia looking for pressure points, for, for, and I would particularly point to the Sea of Azov and attempts to try and cut the catch straits and put pressure on um, the east of Ukraine there. And of, of course, the continued attempts to destabilize Ukraine um, through its economic system and corruption and so on. Um, so it's, I think it's really the number one priority for us is to help the Ukrainians deal with corruption, and strengthen themselves, because a, a successful Ukraine, a politically strong, economically vibrant Ukraine, is like is, 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 a, is a terrible thing for Russia because it shows that this, this can work. And, and Putin's approach fundamentally is nihilistic. He says, there is no other way. This is it's never going to get any better. You've just got to stay with me. And if people look across the board in Ukraine and say, hey, there's an alternative and it's better, that's terribly, that's really destabilizing for him. Yeah, anyone else? Uh, uh, the prospects there? 
I know, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, up, you know, that they act in ways where it's deniable. And that's where you concentrate a lot of your efforts in reporting. Um, are they going to continue to use the Wagner group or to destabilize things? What are their options? Well, uh, for, first of all, I, I would like to say that um, any escalation at this point in Ukraine will be most likely a function of internal domestic issues in, in Russia. Uh, dropping of popularity just before elections, for example, or as we had um, a lot of discontent on the ground in Crimea because of the lackage, lack of uh, shortage of water. Uh, so whenever we see such symptoms of, of a sort of a downward spiral of popularity of the Kremlin, we see an escalation of, of, of rhetoric, at least, uh, towards Ukraine. So this is one of the risks for Ukraine, that actually something happens inside Russia and Putin needs a sort of a wag the dog situation. And a second one is, um, as, as we just uh, uh, discussed, a, a, an improvement, a an, an significant improvement in e economic position or in sort of uh, the happiness in Ukraine, because that will be a nightmare for the, for the Kremlin. So um, I, I think that if we see signs of escalation, this might not be a thing. And I agree completely with, uh, with Edward that it's very unlikely that today's Kremlin will risk an all-out war even a war by proxies, just because the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian secret services are much better than they were five years ago. Thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Vice Chair Spanberger, uh, would you like a, a follow-up question? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And to our uh, witnesses, thank you for spending a little bit more time with us. Um, I was just wondering if we could just any general answers uh, or perceptions observations you all would want to share related to the Russian intelligence operation. So I previously served as a case officer uh, with CIA, and this is always a, an area of interest. So just generally speaking, um, if you could uh, speak to how intelligence operations really fit into Putin's larger aim of consolidating power, either domestically or expanding influence internationally, um, I would be interested in, in your thoughts on that. If I might just jump in very briefly, because I'm sure Christo has also got some thoughts on this, but I think it's one of the weaknesses of the Putin system that as a former intelligence officer, and you may recognize this from your past life, um, he, he tends to overestimate the importance of things that are called secret. And he has a slightly distorted worldview. Um, he's, um, I think, sees um, the secret world in very sharp colors and um, perhaps sharper, sharper than they, they, they should be. Um, the he, He's got tremendous, you know, the, the, uh, and I think the, uh, another thing that's worth, worth looking at is the competition between the intelligence branches, so they're not all playing on the same team. Obviously, that would never happen in a Western country, the intelligence organizations would be um, rivals, um, but um, the, the, that's, uh, that's certainly another element. And one detects certain, we saw in the um, attack on the United States political system, the SVR was conducting one cyber operation, and the GRU was co conducting another, and they were on the same network. And, and when, you, when you talk about the 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 differences there, are there also significant differences um, in terms of how they're funded, how they're prioritized, and how does that impact us? And and I think uh, one of the other witnesses wanted to add something, so I'll just open that back up. So, so if I may just sort of jump in on that exact point. So one thing to think about, there are many intelligence services, the FSB, the successor to the KGB, can also be thought of as perhaps the largest economic organization in all of Russia, having a little slice of just about everything in the entire country. So part of the reason that Putin is so afraid of what happens after Putin is his belief and everyone's belief that if basically a new group comes in, they're all going to whatever is the modern version of the guillotine and they'll all be expropriated. So in that sense, their life is a day-to-day -day existential struggle to keep that future from happening. And so that's part of their fear. The success will be reversed in a very awful way. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank, thank oh. you. Chair recognizes Representative Costa. The, the, Representative Costa is the chair of the Transatlantic Dialogue uh, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I, I think this morning's hearing is uh, very important to our collective will to coming together with a strategy uh, with our, our European partners on um, the flexing uh, problem of Russia that we've discussed this morning. 
I, I have a different version of how I describe Russia today uh, that I suspect that I hope many of you would agree with. I think modern day Russia um, is their version of the Sopranos. Um, and um, uh, the, the Sopranos, of course, um, uh, a, um, the, the situation in Russia with the, the uh, oligarchs, I think, dependent upon one another and Putin. Um, you, you touched upon uh, a key to uh, destabilizing this, this partnership as their common interest in their financing and whether it's laundering money in London or their Swiss bank accounts. Uh, why do you believe that the West, uh, is it just a lack of leadership has been uh, discounting the last four years where there was something else going on in my view, um, a, a, a strategy to really undermine the financial underpinnings of how this, this um, uh, underworld system, this, this corrupt uh, soprano group continues to function? Well, if I may, Congressman, just jump in quickly on that. It's incredibly lucrative. You know, if you are a lawyer, a banker, an accountant, a PR guy selling um, real estate, you can make a fortune. You can make life changing amounts of money working for these people. And it doesn't feel that bad. We don't yet have, I, I think almost the first thing we need is normative pressure. People should feel bad about taking these people on as clients. They should feel that their people aren't going to talk to their kids at school, that no one's going to want to talk to them at parties, they won't get into golf clubs, whatever. We, we need normative pressure. This is bad. Um, and we don't have that at the moment. In many countries, it seems completely respectable, normal, understandable, even creditable to be building bridges with Russia, doing business you know, with, with, with these people. And until that changes, it's going to be very difficult to get some, get some traction. But isn't there basically just a, a, a lack of a, a, st a strategy that the West can agree on to implement? Well, we need we need to stick. I mean, someone's got to lead. I mean, I think if we sit around waiting for a united Western strategy, we're going to be waiting a long time, and we'll we'll, we'll lose. No, but I think the strategy has to come from us. Absolutely. The, as I said in my testament, the U.S. has to lead on this. You're the biggest and the strongest element in this. And, and, so, and how, what, would, what would be involved in that strategy between our European allies and ourselves, uh, Mr. Weber? Oh, sure. So, I mean. The, I think part of your question is to understand what are the limitations of sanctions. As mentioned by Professor Gessen, we think that sanctions are, there's a bad thing, stop it, we'll put this pain on you, and we'll take it away when it leaves, uh, when you stop doing it. But because we've sanctioned so many different things of Russian foreign policy, that basically, if Putin were to acknowledge any one part of it, we, he would in effect create a market for sanctions and for Russian foreign policy, and we'd know exactly what to do in order to get him out of Crimea or whatever else. And so that's in an essence, so what we can do in terms of sanctions is just to think what are basically the secondary ones. And, to, and one of the other things that Putin is able to do is the, the secretary, uh, so in the State Department's Office of Chief Economist, they've published research that showed that Putin was able to compensate every single sanctioned individual private company and state-owned enterprise in Russia, either directly from the state budget or through increased state orders. Because what happens in these authoritarian countries is that these sanctions on basically like the oligarchs or the big companies is just an opportunity to be compensated by Putin. It becomes this loyalty test. So I think what Mr. Lucas and the others have been describing is what are the second and third order effects that we can think of, um, whether it's basically normative pressure or to think about what are the sanctions effects on people who are not directly that oligarch um, and not directly working with the Russian state. That's the sort of stuff that um, I think is being suggested here. Thank you. Uh, my time's expired, but this is a conversation, Mr. Chairman, that I think the subcommittee needs to continue to pursue to try to see if we can, um, on the con congressional side, put in place a framework that would allow us to move forward uh, on a bipartisan strategy. Uh, I think we have to do this. Great. Thank you, Representative. And we do have legislation that's been moved and others that will, will move together. So I appreciate well, that. And this committee will continue to look at uh, this issue 
uh, it's so integral to uh, the area of responsibility we have on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, we need to get our just, European out to work with us I, on this, I think. I agree, and thank you for your work in that regard. The, uh, just as some uh, closing uh, remarks I might have where I'll give you an opportunity to, uh, if you'd like to, to uh, comment on, may not be necessary. <clears throat> uh, we touched on one of my concerns uh, with uh, Vice Chair Spanberger's questioning about succession. Uh, you know, one of the alternatives in how Putin maintains his control in an authoritarian way is the argument, well, no one else can do it. Well, no one else can do it in his narrative because no one else is there. Uh, you know, uh, several years ago, people looked like pe people like Rogozin as a possible successor. You know, uh, those things disappear quickly politically. Uh, and I know that we even have people uh, that in uh, that are concerned privately that if he leaves, there could be, as uh, Dr. Weber had said, the guillotines and uh, violence and unrest, maybe even a civil discord uh, of major proportions in that country. Uh, if you want to comment on those concerns as a closing remarks that you may have. And number two, if uh, Russia does have a setback, if the people, if there is a chance for reform there, what effect might that have? It seems like in this world, authoritarianism breeds more authoritarianism. Uh, and if we start to see some of these countries like Russia uh, continue to fail, I say continue because in terms of fulfilling their obligations and responsibilities to their own people, they are failing. Um, what, what could that be effect? What could be the effect of that? So yeah, I'll give you a chance, just closing remarks, if you want to just touch on either of those two issues. Uh, or something we haven't touched on very briefly. I'll start uh, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, with uh, Professor uh, Gessen first. Thank you. Um, so I, I actually think that the question of succession and the uh, and the question of uh, and 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 the fears of unrest and the question of whether authoritarianism breeds more authoritarianism are one question. Uh, and the answer is yes. The longer the Putin regime survives, the less possibility there is for um, for anything positive to grow on that scorched earth. Um, as for Weber? whether, Sorry. go ahead, Professor. I thought you were done. As for whether things will get worse uh, when Putin <clears throat> leaves office. Uh, I would just like to remind you that those same fears were expressed by intelligence services in the United States uh, when Stalin was getting older and weaker. Uh, and um, you know, this country is already gripped by violence. It is already a dying place where people are dying from violence, where people are dying from despair, where um, we're just living there is a terrible, frightening experience. Uh, it is a non-zero possibility that it will get worse, but it will also be a moment of great opportunity. And the sooner that moment comes, the better our prospects. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Weber? So uh, thank you all for your attention, for your excellent questions. As you said in your, in your remarks, uh, Putin doesn't have any other reasonable political opponents. So he's been running against this idea of the 1990s, that after me, it's the flood. And that is, in essence, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'd like to leave the subcommittee with is the Russia, the country is great. The Russian people are totally great. The people who are afraid of democracy and the people who are afraid of political change in Russia itself is Putin, the circle around him and that larger political elite who are afraid of the exact sort of payback that they've done to their predecessors. And it's that fear which is making sure that they are trying to hold the, the country basically in this arrested development, um, you know, for on and on. So it's not that the Russian people don't want democracy, it's that they look at the elite and then thinking, if Putin isn't there, what are those elite gonna to do to each other? And that might be the war of all against all that the Russian people are actually afraid of. And so that's in essence, you know, the very delicate line that we need to thread. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Groza. 
couldn't agree more. Um, I, I have to say that until I saw and until we identified this domestic assassination program that is so pervasive um, that culminated in the attempt on Navalny, uh, I didn't realize how unlikely it is for this government to ever allow a change through peaceful means. Um, having this program, which is completely um, out of any domestic law and, and, and anti-constitutional, have run, having run it for so many years, makes it very, very unlikely that there will be a, um, a mechanism that will allow for a peaceful change. So, uh, coming back to some of the mechanisms to, to encourage a, a possible uh, desire by the oligarchs or the elite to enforce a change on its own, I, I can't agree more um, that a, a secondary and tertiary sanctions uh, put sanctions where they cannot be sub substituted and, and, and offset by gifts by the Kremlin. Um, yeah, the Kremlin can offer money to offset the loss of, of revenue for oligarchs. What the Kremlin cannot offer in, in, in exchange for, uh, for Western sanctions is replace, for example, visas or residence permits for the wives and for the families of the oligarchs who definitely want to live and, and, and uh, study outside of Russia. So just do this. It's a sovereign right of the uh, Western world to decide who gets visas and who doesn't. But, but look for things that cannot be supplement, uh, substituted by the Kremlin in order for it to hurt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lucas. Thanks. I endorse what my uh, colleagues have said. Um, there are two things we're really bad at. One is predicting what's going to happen in Russia, and the other is <laughs> the other is influencing it. And if you put those two together, you're almost bound to get it wrong. So I think that we should, we analytically, we can see succession is a real problem, and the system is highly unstable. It's personalised. Institutions have been hollowed out. Regimes tend to split at the top or um, crumble at the bottom but how and when and where we don't know. So in the meantime, let's just concentrate on what we can do. And that's cleaning up our system. Um, that's not just, doesn't make it safer in terms of attacks from outside. It boosts confidence inside if people see that um, the system is run in the interests of the, the voters and the taxpayers and not um, by mysterious dark money behind the scenes. Um, so that's you know, super important. Live by, live by, live by our own values. Um, and if we do that, we are at least have a fighting chance of influencing things in um, in Russia in the right in, in 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 the in the right direction, and also defending ourselves against other threats such as such as China, which we've touched on. Um, so the, all these tools are in our hands. We are not weak because we um, were outgunned in some great war. We are weak because we unilaterally you know, disarmed um, some protections we had. We can put them back again. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank all our witnesses, our members. Uh, as uh, Representative Costa had said, uh, I think this is a subject uh, that we'll, we'll just touch the surface of, that we'll continue to uh, find more information on. Uh, this panel has been uh, extraordinary. I thank you for your time and your insight. Uh, members of the committee will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length and limitations of the rules. With that being said, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.